took me a second to find it. Okay, we are now recording. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Lois to get us started. Please feel free to chat if you have any Thank questions you. or comments. Um, I will be keeping an eye on the chat throughout the session. All right, y'all, I'm going to stop my video just to make sure everything goes smoothly here. But if anything funky happens, just let me know. All right, so welcome to Tips, Tricks, and Perks. We were thinking about um, ideas for UL VLC sessions, and this is one that I kind of came up with. And um, Jenny and Paolo were super, super awesome to volunteer to present on all the things that different areas of the library can offer to us as staff. So I'm going to start us off talking about reserving study spaces. So this perk may not initially seem that exciting, but I did want to highlight our room reservation options because they can provide flexibility and privacy that you may not have in your assigned workspaces. We have a variety of room reservation options in both the tower and the DMC. Since I handle the tower rooms, I'll stick to those, but definitely when you have a chance, check out what the DMC has to offer as well. All right, so why would you reserve a study space as a staff or faculty or an employee of the library? Um, FYI, you're going to hear me refer to them as spaces and not rooms, because not every space is technically a room. Um, I think to be considered a room, it has to have a door and they don't all have doors. But speaking of doors, the number one reason is privacy. So maybe you need to take a private phone call or schedule a doctor's, uh, schedule a doctor's appointment things like that, and you need a small space where you can be alone and just close the door. Or maybe you're tired of eating lunch in the same place every day and you want to change a scene, or you brought your favorite tuna surprise and you want to spare your coworkers from having to go through that experience with you. Um, reserving a study space is an excellent option if you do want a little privacy. In addition for, to options for privacy, there are also options for collaboration. If you're like me, yes, Joe, we're going to get to that. Um, <laughs> um, I'm in a shared office, so sometimes if I'm meeting with a coworker, it's a little bit easier to reserve a space where we can focus on the task at hand and have fewer interruptions. Maybe you need to do a brainstorming session with a committee or a work group. The whiteboard wall rooms on floors two through four are excellent spaces to visualize your ideas. Yeah, there are these um, spaces constructed out of whiteboards um, that are really tall and you can write all over them. If you ever go up in the tower during exam time, you might see some examples of some really cool collaboration. And then finally, definitely one of the best perks of our study rooms are the windows. Not every office or workspace has a window. Mine doesn't. Sometimes you just need a little sunshine as motivation to finish that project or to get through the day. So you can reserve a study space for a little self-care. All right, so now that you know why it's a perk, let's go over how to reserve a space. Some of you may be familiar with this, in which case, hang on, there'll be some really cool stuff shortly. <laughs> um, but not everybody does this all the time. So in the slides, I've included the full instructions that we use to train our students and staff at the CERC desk, but I'm not going to read through every single little piece. I did want to provide these in case it's helpful to have written instructions for reference, and I'm not sure if we'll share the slides or not overall, but if you want a copy, just let me know and I'll be happy to send them along if it helps to have something to refer back to. So I'm just going to go over the process and then do a little live demo where you are welcome to follow along. So from our library homepage, there's a box on the top right called highlighted library resources. Oop, I went too far. Okay. Then in this box, you're going to click on reserve a study space to quickly get to the correct place. Then you'll see a web page describing all of our library spaces. It's very useful info, but for right now, we're just going to click on reservable spaces. Uh, if you are familiar with SpringShare products, our room reservation system is called Spaces and it's from SpringShare. So this next page might look familiar. It goes over the two main categories of rooms that we have. Jackson Library General is the tower and then the DMC lists all of its spaces as well. 
If you know what kind of space you need, you can click on the relevant category. Or if you just want to see every single thing that's available, you can click on all categories. However, that one can be a little overwhelming. So I typically recommend just clicking on one category and switching to another one if it doesn't have what you need. Then once you click on a category, it takes you to the actual reservation page. Here's a preview of the top of the page. One thing to point out is view confirmed bookings on the top right. This is helpful if you're trying to find a reservation that someone else made. If they named the reservation, then you can find it easily by clicking on that button. Scrolling down the page, you'll come to the availability grid. If you use a screen reader or if you're recommending this to somebody who uses a screen reader, just be aware sometimes they don't get along very well with this grid. So we recently added a little notice in there saying that if you use a screen reader, just give us a call at the desk and we'll be happy to make it on the back end for you. Or if you're doing it, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to do it for you. So on this grid, each colorful square represents half an hour. The max reservation time is two hours a day, so that's four little squares per day. You can do those four squares hey. all in a row um, at different times of the day and or in different spaces. You're not limited to just doing one room a day right, for one sequence of time. You can see the little colorful guide at the bottom indicating that blue squares are available spaces, yellow squares are ones that you're clicking on when you're making the booking, and then red squares are unavailable, aka they have already been reserved. The rooms in that particular category you clicked on are on the left, and then they're all hyperlinked. You can click on them for more info. The grid automatically shows the current date and time, and then at this scroll bar at the bottom you can scroll through um, days, I think through the next week, it usually shows you. Um, but if you do want to go to a specific date, there's a button for that at the top. Or if you want to click through like week by week, you can use those arrow keys. And yes, make sure that when you are looking at the grid that you're actually looking at the date and time that you want to book. This was a big issue when we were open 24 five and the days would just flow into one another. We got a lot of 12 a.m. reservations for people who were trying to book 12 p.m. Um, so just double check before you <laughs> complete the process. Okay, so to actually make the booking, you're gonna click on a blue square, it'll turn yellow. Then a box pops up underneath the grid. You can either just keep clicking on more little squares or there is a drop down field um, in that box that popped up and it will show you the next um, three consecutive time slots, assuming they are available. Um, you can either click on those to book those times or you can go back in and click more little squares. If you did choose your um, the rest of your reservation from these drop down fields here and then you decide oh wait I don't actually need that time. If you click the trash can button next to it it's going to delete every single thing that you clicked, whereas if you click the individual squares it'll make a new little drop down link for each one of the squares you click and that way you can say oh wait I don't actually need it until 430 I just need it until four and then you can go back and delete them individually just FYI. So if you go over more than the max four time slots a day, you're going to get this lovely yellow error message. However, if you made a booking earlier that day, like let's say you book 12 to 1, and then later you come and you make a separate booking, that's going to put you over your max four hours. It's not going to tell you till the next step, but then you'll see this red box. Okay, so you've chosen your reservation times and you're ready to complete the reservation. You're going to click submit times. And this is where a lot of patrons run into trouble because you think I clicked all the buttons, I click submit, I must be done, right? Not quite yet. There's a couple little more things to go through. At this point, if you are not already logged in online with your UNCG credentials, it's going to prompt you to log in with the single sign on at that point. The next web page summarizes your bookings and then you have another chance to delete the reservation. Um, this page includes the terms and conditions like don't do weird stuff on the computer don't like put your tuna surprise in there, not clean up after yourself, that kind of stuff. Um, then you have to click continue to actually finish up. 
So it's not pictured here, but you will now see the final step in the process. You can still delete your reservation at this point if you change your mind. And then to complete the booking, there are some form fields, a couple of which are required. So this is the point in time where you can name your reservation if you want to, like let's say you're meeting people from across campus and you wanna name it, you know, collaboration committee or whatever it is. So that way, if they're looking it up, um, they can find you. But the couple that are required are phone number, which is for emergencies or if there's some kind of last minute notification and we need to tell you, oh, I'm sorry, that room had a pipe burst or something and it's not available, we can get in contact with you. And then you're gonna choose your status. That's just if you're faculty, staff, different kinds of students or other. Um, Y'all are probably going to choose faculty or staff, and this is helpful on our end for usage statistics. Then you finally get to click submit my booking, and at that point you're done. So you'll see a final confirmation page that looks a little bit at something like that. After you finish the reservation, you're going to receive a confirmation email sent to your UNCG email address, and that is super important, not only because you can forward it if you have other group members at your meeting, um, it gives you little directions to the room in case you haven't been there before, but it also includes a link to cancel your reservation in case your plans change and you don't want it, you know, you want to release that time to others. Okay. I know that was a lot of information at once, um, but very quickly, I just want to walk through this process to show that there are a few steps, but it's not as long as it may seem. Um, if you do follow along on your end, um, please don't click the same squares that I do. It might lock us both out. <laughs> so let me, oh, I want to, I clicked away from that exit slideshow. Okay. So here we are on the library website. And again, right here, you just click on reserve a study space and then reservable spaces. Let's say that I know I want a room with a computer. Right now, we only have one set of rooms that have computers and those are the small student study rooms on the second floor. So I'm gonna click the one that says with PC. Here you see a little like generic photo of a room, some information. Here's the line about screen readers. Here's we added this to try to guide people through the steps. Um, let's say that I want to do this for next Thursday and I want it for 3 p.m. So all of these rooms are clear. I'm gonna do it there. And you can see, look, it pops up a little information down there and you can either continue to add time down there or you can click a new one and it gives you another option. If you say, wait, I only need it until four, just delete that. Then once you've clicked everything you want to click, submit times. It's going to think about it. I've already logged into my email today. Um, it's giving me another option to back out if I don't actually want to make the reservation, and it's going to tell me the terms and conditions. So just click continue. I'm going to call this test fun. Um, Here's my phone number and I am staff. And then at this point, if you decide, again, you don't want to go through with it, you can click log out or submit my booking to be finished, and there it is. And at that point, if you wanna make another booking, you can. All right, so hopefully this is useful if you've not thought about these rooms as a perk before. You can go in, practice if you want, delete if you want, um, and I hope that these are gonna be very useful to you. So I will turn it over to our next presenter. All right, that was great, Lois. Thanks for sharing that with us. And I will be the next presenter. I'm just um, sharing my screen now. Um, share. Um, is everybody seeing large format printing at the DMC? Yes, looks great. Thank you. So everybody knows me, I believe, who are in this. My name is Paula Damasceno. I am the DMC Multimedia Instruction Coordinator. Uh, I do multimedia instruction coordination. This is a typo. Uh, I will be talking about the large format printing printer that we have at the DMC that we shall get um, authorization to start to charge for, uh, for the next fall. What is a large format printer for? Um, there are many um, ways to use it and reasons why you may want to use it. And on the right side here, you see a poster that Lois herself asked us to print for an event um, that 
just happened in the spring, at the end of the spring, snacks, coloring, and more. So she designed it that beautifully and sent it to us and we printed for her and we took it to her upstairs. And the advantages of doing with us, well, one of them is that we are not charging yet. So it was free, but also we were available for like kind of a same day printing while when you go and send a service to the printing services, the Spartan printing services, you might not get that um, speed uh, of service uh, because they have they, they, they serve the whole campus in like large numbers and uh, high volume. So you can look, um, uh, you can uh, look for to uh, print a poster, a sign, a photography, a fine art print, and even uh, plan for small edition publications with that large format because um, it one, it's a high quality printing, beautiful. Uh, you can see uh, when you come down to the DMC, we have one brick print uh, on top of it, and you can you can see how beautiful the colors are and how it's uh, really reliable printing. Um, so here we have a student who um, is basically an overflow from the art department who uh, they do have uh, large format format printing there, but um, this student used our printer to print their work here uh, and was beautiful. The colors are wonderful. The paper, um, pretty nice. We do provide our, so let's talk about what the printer is. And um, I can later sh share that presentation. So you can click on that link that directs you to the Epson website where you can have tech more technical information about the printer, but it's an Epson short color P6000. And the maximum printing size is 24 inches by 529 uh, inches. So it's a row of paper that is inside the, the printer here. We do provide a professional media double weight. There is a typo here, I'm sorry, matte paper row. Um, and we uh, like to say that we, although we could print a, a 24 by 529, we are limiting it 24 by 82. So it's printable and we have a surface where it needs to rest flat for a little while to dry. Um, one word that is important to highlight here is that we did not pur purchase the same thing that Dax has so we don't over like we don't overlap uh, needlessly overlap services here. So uh, while Dex can print a scientific poster, which normally are required to be 36 by 48. Of course, you may uh, pay attention to the guidelines of your conference. If you are presenting in a conference, please always um, check the guideline of that specific conference because they might vary. But if it is 36 by 48, then uh, reach out to DAX Studio. And again, uh, it's linked here, their page. Uh, and um, there is a maximum thickness of uh, 1.5 milli milli millimeters um, to the paper. You can um, bring your own paper, but it needs to be a inkjet paper and we will need to look for the profile of the paper to be installed in that computer that we have attached to the, um, uh, connected to the printer. And once we do that, we can then use the paper you bring that again needs to be a uh, inkjet uh, paper with a maximum thickness of 1.5. It can also um, bring transparency paper. We have students here who have uh, brought their transparency papers for different purposes, but basically uh, we do provide you with the paper. So 
you can make use of that of that as Lois did. So how to request a print? Uh, we have a step-by-step -step here, which is basically go to the DMC, uh, DMC lib guides. Um, then in, this is the link. Then you click on printing at the DMC, as you can see here. And from the drop-down menu, you click on large format printing. It's a drop-down menu because we are expecting to have the risograph printing as a second option here. So, and once you are there on large format printing, you click here to request a uh, request printing. And that will lead you to a form that in a moment we will we'll explore um, lively. Then you fill the form and upload your file. If you need instruction on how to prepare your file though, you can contact us and you, we can give you guidelines. Although at some point the guidelines will be at the lib, in the lib guides as well. And we have some uh, two books here that again, we will uh, see in a moment, but um, are two books that we have in the library that are helpful for digital printing. So how to contact the DMC? So here are two emails. Um, this is the Department of Email. Oh, my typos are wild today. Um, this is almost my email. My email actually doesn't have that C, that E here. And um, also you can request instruction for um, different purposes and um, here is how it looks like the uh, instruction request uh, form that is in our libguide. So I guess now what I want to do is to exit that slideshow and go to the website, the we did have lib guide. Question. We had a question from Leah about like for the people who bring their own paper, where do they get it? Like the office supply store or? Mm -hmm. you get that kind of paper um so you can get paper at office depot if they will would be like photo paper um on a uh letter size legal size maybe but anything bigger than that you can look for on amazon dnh adorama you, what you need to be, um, what you need to uh, pay attention to is to put the right words. So you don't just don't want to put like printing paper. You want a photo printing paper for inkjet. Epson makes wonderful paper, and generally, if you have an Epson machine and an Epson paper, you are in good shape there. You don't need to. You can use. Um, for example, I you forward inkjet paper, and there is a much there are much more papers out there. But in general, what you need to know is you need to stick to a photo paper that is for an inkjet. Does it answer the question, Leah? Or um, okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, absolutely. So here we are at the lib guides. Um, and here is the printing at the DMC. You click on large format and you have here the cost, which is a little bit complicated, but uh, we decided to stick to the same charges the art department um, is uh, charging. So we don't create any competition. We, the, our goal is not to, <laughs> uh, to compete with them, but to support and create a space where their students and faculty can overflow to the DMC and print here as well. So it is cheaper than this, the printing services um, if you use the same paper. And here's an example on how to calculate it. Um, there are two things that we take in consideration. One is ink and another is paper. And that makes the to total cost of print. Um, here are the two uh, really helpful books uh, on digital printing. And when we click here, 
we then got, got get to the um, printing request form, which is pretty simple and you can uh, upload your file. Uh, you just let us know if you're bringing a paper or if you're going to use our own paper, your name, and we will automatically collect your UNCG email when we get uh, that. You need to be logged in um, to be able to fill that form. Um, it, that's it. Thank you for being here today. And let me know if I think questions will be all together at the end, if I'm not wrong, uh, or maybe I am. I will so stop we, to uh, share. We can, do, uh, we can do questions at the end. Although if anyone has like a, an immediate burning question, feel free to <laughs> put it in the chat. But thank you, that's awesome. Um, the prints look amazing, the examples that you have. So thank you for sharing. Okay, friends, we're in kind of kind of switch around a little bit in terms of what we are going to be talking about today um, with my section. So let me go ahead and share. Okay, I'm gonna be talking about finding your next great read. Okay, so let me make sure I have all my stuff. I haven't done, um, I haven't presented in Zoom since, well, it was only last week, but for some reason it feels like a really long time ago since I'm used to doing it so often. All right, I'm gonna be talking about a resource called Novelist Plus. I'm just curious, and you can answer this in the chat if you'd like, um, if anyone has used Novelist Plus. Um, it sounds like Rachel has, yes, excellent. I'm seeing a no. Rachel, are you raising your hand to show that you have used it? Okay, wait. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. A mix. Most people have not. Well, I'm excited then. Extra excited. Um, so this is the description that we have on our um, databases list. Uh, has reading recommendations for both fiction and nonfiction for all ages. Novelist ex expertise in books and reading means always getting the best help for finding the right books. I use Novelist a lot. I'm a big reader. I know um, that many of my colleagues are big readers as well. We are going to get to it and I'm going to demo it. We can access it through the databases list, which I will show you. But for now, I just want to tell you a little bit about what you can find in there. So the way that I typically use Novelist is if I have found something that I really like, an author, a book, a series, and I want to find stuff that is similar. So you can search in Novelist Plus. You can do a basic search and you see I have a little screenshot here um, where you can search by keyword, title, author, series, etc. Um, and then you can also do an advanced search and I'll show you when I demonstrate it, but there are so many different limits. I said dozens here and I'm pretty sure it's at least multiple dozens. You can also browse. This is one of the things that to me is really unique about novelists compared to other sort of readers advisory tools. And this is my understanding is that it was created as a reader's advisory tool for public library workers, um, but it is set up in such a way that it can be used for that and it can also be used for like your own personal reader's advisory, but you can browse by genre, appeal, themes, award winners, and audiobooks. We will go through, particularly appeal, because you might think, what is that? As I did the first time I saw it. You can also browse through recommended reading lists. Um, I'll show you that. You can find author book and series read alikes. This is something that I have found really useful myself. And then you can suggest your own read alikes. If you're thinking, oh, well, this author is very similar to this other author, you can actually make a suggestion to Novelist and they will um, uh, consider integrating it into the database. Novelist. I'm pretty sure that everyone who works there, or at least many of the people who work there are in Durham, North Carolina, um, working through EBSCO. Uh, a lot of people I went to library school with ended up working at Novelist. So sometimes I'm in here and I'm reading little reviews and I say, oh, I know Hallie, I know, I, I know Shauna, you know, kind of, it's fun. We're gonna try it, let's do this. All right, I'm gonna start at the library homepage where all the magic happens. That's one of my lines I use in class a lot. Um, and I am going to go to our databases list. 
And you can browse directly to it, but you will see that I have searched for it many a time. And I'm going to go to it here. I'm also going to grab, oops, I'm going to grab a link for you all that I will pop in the chat if you are interested in taking a look. But I'm just gonna go through a few things. If you have questions as I'm going through, or if there's something you see that intrigues you, please let me know and I will be happy to um, show it. But the this is the main page here. Um, there are these recommended reads list over on the left. I mentioned those. Um, they have uh, some sort of suggestions here for, and these are some of these sort of appeals types of things that they have. Um, they tell you um, more like, so here, this is for an adult audience, dramatic and large cast of characters. And we can kind of go through and see what they've got. You can read about each one. Um, you can also browse by genre. And they do have different sort of explore these explore pages where you can say, oh, I'm interested in book club resources. What's what's what are the cool book club resources that are available? Um, and it'll show you some of the um, popular book club picks, etc. So there's a lot even just on that main page. Um, but I want to go. I thought I would take a look here. Um, Let's see, I'm gonna go to this list that's, uh, so again, it's, I'm looking at fiction, recommended reads list over here on the left. They do have plenty of nonfiction here as well. I just happen to be more of a fiction reader. Um, and I'm gonna go with for fans of, cause I don't actually know what that is. Okay, there we go. How about this? For fans of, how about for fans of, Oh, let's let's do for fans of only murders in the building. I like that show and I just learned that they are coming back with a second season at the end of June, if anyone else is also into it. Um, so for fans of only murders in the building, maybe, you know, I want to get my like, get my fix in between um, now and when it starts coming out, I can um, take a look at what are some of the things that they have recommended. Um, so I actually read a couple of things on here. Um, and would agree. Ronnie Lauren, like Sam said, is an author I love. It's a romance author. I have not, um, I guess I kind of understand why this one. Okay. At first I was like, I don't know about this, but it is about a true crime podcaster. Um, I read Finley Donovan is killing it. Let's that this stressed me out. Some of you who know me well know that, um, I get really stressed when, um, like the show how to how to get away with murder like when something terrible happens and no one even thinks about you know calling any kind of authority i understand why but it still stresses me out um so when i am looking at this i have can get more information about the book here's some reviews that i can take a look at and these are usually from um these are usually sorry, I guess, my problem when i'm in <laughs> What I'm in here is that I just get um, really distracted by all the good book stuff from uh, like, you know, uh, trade publications, book lists, library reads, publishers weekly, library journal, sometimes Kirkus. Um, you can also get to more about this book, which is um, usually just some of our subject headings and things that we might like, as well as ISBNs. So just if you're looking, you know, if you want to look it up quickly somewhere else, this can be inform this can be helpful information. Um, I am going to, let's see here. You can click on the series um, to see what else you might like, but I just wanna point out the read-alikes over here. And one of the things that distracted me is that this read-alike of the Spellman Files, and this was a series I loved by Lisa Lutz. And so same kind of thing. I can go into um, this book. I can read more about it as well as the series. When there are a lot of audiobook options, there's usually an audiobook tab here um, where you can see kind of generally what's out there and what's available. You cannot, to my knowledge, check out any books through Novelist. Um, I will, however, show you what you can do if you, um, you know, come across a book or a series or author that is of interest to you. So that's just, it's, you can, you can quickly spiral in a good way, like a good, like a positive spiral um, as you are looking through these different options and kind of exploring different read-alikes and so forth. But I'll show you this. If I click this view all in the read-alikes section, 
it will give me a list where each one has a very um, quick overview of why it is suggested as a read alike. So uh, in this case, with Finley Donovan is killing it, which is how I got here in the first place, it says, appealing heroines embark on a madcap adventures in these funny novels when one is hired to kill a man, Finley Donovan, and one needs to track down her precocious younger sister and solve a cold case in the Spellman files. Um, Hallie, I went to library school with her. Like I said, cracks me up when I see these names, people I knew. Um, but this gives me a sense of like, why, are, why is this particularly... Um, you went to library school with Katie Rosie. A lot of people who go to uh, go to Sills <laughs> or who work here went to Sills. It seems to be a pipeline. Um, but so to me, this is really helpful, and it can give me my one my one problem with this kind of page. I think it's really meant just to be printed and like shared because none of this is clickable. So I would just have to remember. Okay, maybe I need to look at. Um, uh let's see someone i have not talked about yet susan dunlap not familiar with susan dunlap but maybe i want to make a note that susan dunlap is someone i want to check out you can also give them thumbs up thumbs down all that kind of stuff if you're like i agree or if you think oh no this is a terrible read alike all right so again that was kind of a, a fun spiral like when you go on wikipedia to look for one thing and you just end up somewhere else entirely. Um, but I want to show you now that was all just through browsing and looking at books. That way, I want to show you the search options. Um, so I mentioned the basic search and um, I did, let's take a look. I made some notes. I was looking um, for, this happens to be mysteries as well. I don't, um, mysteries is not my number one genre that I read, but I am really excited coming out the same day as the next season of um, Only Murders in the Building is uh, the new book in Ellie Griffith's, um, we'll go to her series tab, in her Ruth Galloway mysteries. Um, so I can look at the different series that she has and I can find more information about those. So for example, I can see some of the descriptions of her, of her work here some of her appeal terms, which we will again talk through in a moment, but you can see things like what genre is this considered to be? How is the character described? What kind of storyline, what kind of tone, what kind of style? And you'll see how I end up kind of making, making this work for me. I do get some read-alikes over here, just generally for this author, but because I know that I particularly like this one series, Ruth Galloway series, I can click on this mysteries, uh, Ruth Galloway mysteries link here, or I can click on the series read-alikes, which is what I'm going to do. Um, same kind of deal here is what we saw before, um, but I want to make a note that the last one listed here, I know we have some Bones fans in the room today, um, is the Temperance Brennan mystery series from Kathy Reichs, which is loosely connected with the TV show Bones. Um, so that might be something um, that I want to take a look at because, in fact, they are both forensic anthropologists. Well, Ruth is a forensic archaeologist. Things work pretty similarly. So, um, all right. So I've got that in mind. I wrote it down already. You didn't see me write it down, but I have it written down there. Um, because maybe I want to look into some more of that later on. I want to show you the advanced search now because, as I promised, it has a ton of options. Um, so you can look at, um, let's say I really want to read, oh my gosh, there's just so many. Sorry, I'm getting like so excited just looking at this stuff. So maybe I want to look at a genre, and one of the genres I read a lot is romance. So maybe I want to see if I can find a romance um, for an adult audience uh, with a non-binary author. This I may be limiting this too much um, already just by getting again so so jazzed about things. You can even do so if you um, have children or you are interested in this. There are lexile ranges and grade levels that can help you. Um, narrow things down. You can look at, at accelerated reader interest levels, all kinds of stuff like this. Yeah, Rachel, you have a question. Sorry, what's your question? 
Yeah, I was wondering if, um, do they have like, it, and you may have said something like this, trigger warnings, like if there are scenes that could be particularly like disturbing to readers, is there anything like that? That is a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, we can look when we look at some of the um, books, but that would be something that we could, that we would, you know, that we could definitely yeah. um, suggest to them. Um, say like, hey, Hallie, do you remember me from library school? No, I have a great idea. Um, but yeah, thank you for asking that. That is really great. I have noticed um, that a lot of publisher websites are now doing this, keeping lists of content warnings for different books um, that they have, which I really appreciate. Um, it just helps me prepare mentally. Yeah. Um, for, yeah. I put um, story graph. It's an alternative to Goodreads that's supposed to be, um, I don't know what like a polite way to say this is like not as less like, mean yeah less mean because you um like the way you review and do it is just different um and you can export your goodreads from there to there but anyway you could go there and look up a title and they do have content um warnings um in there and you, you can input content warnings as well and they have people um reviewing them yeah, that's that's cool. good. And Leah mentioned that the North Carolina Digital Library, which I will also talk about, has a range of reviews and sometimes that will have um, helpful information. Sometimes Goodreads does have like the reviewers do put content warnings on there. Um, so that this is helpful, um, helpful to know. I did get some results for my search. Again, there were some good questions asked in the chat about where is this information coming from about this particular gender identity. So um, I will say like from these, okay, I've read a few of these. Um, the most recent one of these that I've read is this one, Love and Other Disasters. I do believe that Anita Kelly is um, openly um, identifies as non-binary um, and yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, um, confirming that for me, Sam, and I did enjoy this book, although it was about a cooking competition show and that stressed me out. Um, so I don't know where the information is coming from, if it's just self-identification um, or if it is like from the publisher, which I think is something that someone mentioned that might be possible. Um, but so definitely something to kind of take a look at and see. So I got 36 results. I can navigate through these in the same uh, way. So. How about this one? Sam just mentioned this one. Um, so we, again, we get a description and we see, so actually, okay, this is not content warning, but this is relevant, Rachel, I think, to like the themes in this case, one of the themes that they will list is like things related to grief, coping with death, things like that. Um, so that can be um, really helpful in terms of at least getting a sense of like, what's going to be, <laughs> what can I expect to find here? I just read a, a book. I get a lot of books through NetGalley, um, advanced reader copies through NetGalley. And I just read one that I was not expecting to be very much about major depression. Um, and it was, that was on me because I didn't really um, do enough research ahead of time, but I, it kind of threw me for a loop because like, I would have read it anyway, but I would have approached it differently because um, it had kind of a fluffy, cute rom-com cover and it was not, it was not like that. It was not a rom-com. Um, but yeah, so I want to show you, people are interested in the appeal terms. I really want to read this book too. Um, okay, so I want to show you about this browse by appeal because to me, this is one of the coolest and most interesting things about, yeah, it took a second, about novelist. Um, so I'm sticking with um, adult audience. I'm going to go with the category. What did I do here? This was um, this is something I do um, a lot is to look in here for ability diverse characters. Um, then you can start to look for category, other categories here, um, pace, storyline, tone. Uh, tone, I think, is I, I'm just looking at my notes because there are so many. Um, but I think that I went with funny, funny books with ability diverse characters. And then you can also do other kinds of things here. Um, so maybe in the storyline, 
I'm trying to, it starts to narrow things down a little bit based on what you've chosen. Um, but you can also do writing style. I like that one of the options is jargon filled, usually not what I am interested in. Um, but let's say, uh, I'm just gonna stick with these two. I am going to look for books with ability diverse characters that are funny in tone. And I'm glad Shelby's here because I know Shelby's also a fellow fan of this Talia Hibbert um, series, but I can start to see things here um, that are coming up that I might not know about, um, which actually a bunch of these I don't know about and I might be interested in taking a look at some of them. Um, this one, a laugh out loud romantic comedy with heart, that sounds fun. Or this one, I saw this one earlier this week when I was, um, oh good. I wish that they had a section where it was like browse by has a dog because I would absolutely um, go to it. Yeah, Lindsay, I went under browse by and then selected appeal. Um, and themes is also interesting, but I'm running out of time, but here we go. Oh, that's cool. Lois says, we looked at a library systems catalog in my information system class that incorporated read-alikes. And I think some genre terms in their catalog, it was a neat widget that made for um, easy browsing. That's awesome. So I was looking at this one again, I looked at the review. I thought, oh, this sounds interesting. <laughs> the, I guess the, the ability diverse part of this is that one of the characters has, um, anxiety and uh, her coping mechanism is biting stuff. Um, so uh, fortunately she is uh, <laughs> employed as a mouthfeel tester at a pencil factory. I gotta read this book. Uh, after seeing it several times this week while I was putting stuff together, I thought this sounds just, just interesting enough to work. Okay. Any questions about, um, I know there's, I went through that quickly. There's so many elements to novelists. I highly encourage playing around with it. Um, one thing before I call on you, Anna, is the folder option. You can create your own um, account here. You do have to have uh, like just create a free account. I think it's the EBSCO account. I think if you have an EBSCO account, you can just use that. But that way, if you're like, oh, I don't remember, um, what that cool thing that I saw so that you can actually keep a folder um, of stuff that you are interested in looking at later. Anna. Yeah, thanks. Really quick, I wanted to say uh, some context about the library catalog and about um, info about authors and gender and how this is like different and or the same. Um, because we do get questions sometimes from patrons who are like, I want a work that is from, or I want to see works that are from um, women or from authors that identify a certain way. And there is, uh, there is some, there are some mark fields where we can capture some of that information, but a lot of that uh, is really kind of frowned upon because it's not the job of the cataloger to search out information about the author that is not provided by the author or that's not needed to um, distinguish the work or the authority record from another person or another work. Um, so if some of this author, like when, when a system like this is unclear about where some of this information is coming from, it makes me a little bit nervous about where they're getting it and if they are searching out stuff um, that hasn't been self-identified by the author. Uh, so I think, I mean, this, is, this can be really helpful for users who are looking for that kind of thing, but if there are, are people out there who are authors who don't want that kind of information shared about themselves, I think it can be, um, this can be a little bit dicey. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you said that. And I, and I looked in their help, which is where I usually go to try to figure out where information is coming from. Um, and it says under author characteristics, it just says if available, the author's gender identity, nationality, and cultural identity will be listed. Again, what does that mean? Available, you know. So thank you for bringing that up. I think that is a good point. And I think that um, especially when we are 
Um, yeah, so some of you have seen me present about critical citation practices where, you know, we look to try to um, amplify voices that are often underrepresented in certain areas of scholarship. And when we're doing that, we are often ending up making a lot of assumptions about people, about their gender identity, about how um, they identify in terms of race or nationality or ethnicity. So I think this that's a really helpful thing to keep in mind and, and that it is, I agree, it's like, I, I would love to know where it's coming from. All right, let me go back to my slides real quick because I say here, what do you do when you find your next book that you want to read or listen to? You can always search the UNCG Libraries catalog to see if we have it. We have a ton of popular fiction and nonfiction. Um, we've got our current literature collection, of course. We've got paperbacks. We have amazing book displays next to the rough desk. Thank you, Rachel, for pointing that out. Um, but we also have a lot in the stacks. We have a lot of popular fiction, especially if it's sort of categorized as like literary fiction. A lot of it ends up in the stacks because of approval plans that we have, or we have a creative writing program, a really good creative writing program um, in um, our English department. And so as the English liaison, I do try to kind of keep up with some of the things that are going on and coming out. So we do, we have a lot of great popular fiction and nonfiction in the library. Um, I hope that all or most of you have public library cards. If you don't, you should get one, if only to use the North Carolina Digital Library, which is powered by Overdrive, and you'll sometimes hear it referred to as Sam did in the chat, Libby, that's the app that goes with it. Um, so I uh, really encourage you to do that. I use my own library card number to check out books, my husband's library card number to check out books my mom's library card number to check out books, my sister's library card number to check out books, check out a lot of books. Um, the nice thing, and yes, it does get a little frustrating if you have any holds on your account, but the nice thing with the digital books, if you ever kind of clear that situation out, Michelle, is that they just go away and they don't charge you any late fees. No, Libby does not cost any money. Um, it is all free. I highly encourage it. And it has really good audio and ebook selections. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is Hoopla. Um, and Hoopla is a resource that you can get through your public library, or they, I think, um, they have, I think it's a recent addition to NC Live. Um, the NC Live version is kind of a bummer in terms of selection. Um, but if you do, if your public library locally, I know many of us live in different um, counties or have like, again, my, my sister lives in Charlotte. I use her library card um, for the Charlotte Digital Library because um, they have a lot of stuff. So the Hoopla that the Hoopla account I have through there gets me lots of access. I use Hoopla mostly for comics and graphic novels, um, but I will just quickly show you. Um, we have, you can get a Hoopla account through NC Live without having a public library card, so it doesn't matter if you have um, the, here we go, personal account required. It doesn't matter if your public library has Hoopla or not, um, but I'm gonna see, gosh, I hope I saved my login here because I do not remember it. Okay, good, I'm logged in. So I just wanted to show, so Kathy Reichs came up, right, whenever I was um, looking at Ellie Griffiths. Um, and I can take a look here and see, and in this case, there are only four that come up from, I think these are all from the Bones series um, or the Temperance Brennan series, but they're audiobooks. So Hoopla has audiobooks, ebooks, and um, comics that are also ebooks. Um, so you can browse through here. Like I said, the selection through NC Live is not as good as what we would typically be able to get through a specific public library um, Hoopla account, but it's still pretty fun to be able to browse through here. So I'm seeing a lot of chats going by. Y'all gotta get public library cards if you don't have one. The public library is the best. Um, and like I said to Michelle, <laughs> I had so many finds at the public library that like every, when I was checking out print books that, that every year for my birthday, my husband would go in and pay off my library finds as a birthday gift. That was like how consistent it was. Um, it has changed my life to have only the uh, only digital books because they just go away. And sometimes it's annoying 
that they're gone. You might not have finished it, but at least you don't have to pay any money. Sam has a hand up. Sam, yes. I was just going to crowdsource. I don't know, Jenny, if you know this, but like this is through the UNCG libraries. Do you think that we can, I know that like when I download these apps on my phone, you know, like Libby and Overdrive that I like put in my public library card, you know, but like, could we get the Hoopla app on our phone. I'm thinking about like for audiobooks. Um, and then, you know, would it then connect to UNCG, you know, or NC Live or it would you know be what I mean? NC Live rather than UNCG. I, actually, this is something Christine yeah, and I that. talked about this years ago that a, not a lot of academic libraries do something like Hoopla because our FTE is so astronomical. Yeah. Um, compared to who their usual customers are. Um, but I mean, I think it's something we could we could continue to look into, but you can definitely get the um, the Hoopla app, even just for the what they do have in NC Live. And I, I think my sense is that this is a newer addition to NC Live, so I hope they'll be adding more. Um, but a lot of public libraries do have access to Hoopla. Um, and pro tip for anyone in Guilford County, you can get a public library card at the High Point Public Library if you're a resident of Guilford County. And at least a few years ago, they had um, they had uh, hoopla access. Um, I will say you should, you know, this is my librarian thing. You should double check that and make sure it's still true. Um, but I have a High Point Public Library card that I got one time when I was over there for an NCLA executive board meeting. Um, and I just had to show that I lived in Guilford County because some of High Point is in Guilford County and some of it is not. So um, just something to uh, keep in mind. And I, I have, think I put this in the chat, but I feel like I didn't know, Jenny told me about this, but if you have an ALA number, you can also sign up for NetGalley, um, which is where you get advanced reading copies um, and then they just download for free on your Kindle. And then all you have to do uh, for it, I mean, it keeps your ratio up, which means they keep giving you books, is a um, is write little reviews, like mine are just like a paragraph. Um, yeah, if you have neck alley questions, let me or Jenny know. I, guess. I mean, I think Catherine does neck alley too. She's in here. Uh, Catherine Hallman. Um, I don't know if she's here. I see. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, like it's, yes, I feel yeah. like I don't get like a whole lot of perks being an ALA member, but I'm yeah. like, I will get me some free advanced reading copy. <laughs> and you don't have to be an ALA member. It just helps you get, I mean, in my experience, it helps. I've never know. gotten denied a book. Well, yeah. I have. So let's stop but, bragging. But, but you but... read like, Jenny reads like a book a day. I don't. Not, not always, but sometimes. <laughs> I have very specific tastes and um, I'm not reading that much. If anyone has that galley question, I'm happy to. But yeah, I love Rachel's idea. I think we should do a ULV LC on for fun reading and we can tie it again like we did today to library resources and stuff like that. Um, sorry that I talked about that stuff for so long, but I'm glad that some people are excited about it. I would love to hear if you go and use um, Novelist, um, please tell me about it um, because I love Novelist. I was hoping Maggie would be able to come here. She had a conflict because I also used Novelist in a very weird way back in, I want to say it was last year at some point where Maggie said, I'm trying to remember this book that I read when I was a kid. And it was um, set in Hawaii and there was a surfer and a girl was living there with her dad over the summer. And we could not find it anywhere on Google. And I found it through a uh, novelist by playing around with a bunch of their advanced search um, techniques. Uh, it was one of my proud librarian moments. Um, to be that could be good for chat. Don't we see yeah, chats so, like that that are like, do, yeah. I have a feeling that a book is somewhere. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I remember reading a book that had a mirror in it, you know, kind of deal. So, all right. Well, I want to thank you all so much for joining. And I want to especially thank Lois for having this idea um, and uh, Lois and Paula both for presenting. I learned a lot today, um, even from doing my own session and preparing for it. Um, and I definitely learned a lot from y'all. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much. This was fun. And I look forward to hearing if you use these tips, tricks, and perks. Bye, everyone.